Bob joined Intel only in 2016, which makes him unusual. You're the first CEO of Intel to not be a company lifer, essentially. And um, you've worked a lot of places. I'm just going to list them quickly. eBay, General Atlantic, EDS, TRW, Webvan, my personal favorite of your, of your former employers, and, and, G and General Electric. And I was, I was sort of going, I think I was going in reverse chronological order, right? That's right. That's right. Um, and um, Bob was interim CEO uh, of Intel for, for seven months. And so you, uh, it was sort of like when uh, Dick, Dick Cheney was head of the search committee to, uh, to be the, for the vice presidential nominee and got the job, right? Very good. Was that, okay. was that a question? <laughs> no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Just trying to get a rise out of you. But uh, OK. So I, I want to I start by giving everybody a sort of grounding in where, where Intel is today. We think of Intel as the company that makes the microprocessors that go in PCs. That's true, but it's not the whole story. In fact, PCs are a smaller percentage of the overall revenue uh, pie than they've ever been. So could, could you explain what, re what Intel's business is today? Yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, the makeup over the years was the CPU inside the PC, and that was the massive growth driver. And several years ago, um, you know, we started to take the CPU and put it inside the server, inside the data center. And then from our vantage point, we saw a world where um, with this, and you've talked about it a lot during the course of the last couple of days, we saw a world where there was this incredible demand for data. And with that demand for data, there was more and more compute that was going into more and more things. So if you think about Intel today, it's evolved from a, what we call a PC-centric company to a data-centric company. And it's not just a CPU inside a PC, but it's a CPU inside of everything, inside a server, inside um, an automobile, inside a factory, inside a retail store, inside your home. So we build the CPUs that essentially go inside more and more things, more and more compute. And in addition to that, over time, we've had to evolve not just building a CPU, but as the world has evolved in the incredible demands for data, it calls for alternate architectures. So we have now you know, GPUs and FPGAs and um, software and more and more things going inside more and more things. So we've evolved from PC to a data center company. Now, for, for Intel's, for much of Intel's history, when you talk about architecture, Intel was the architecture for the PC industry. And as the company has tried to diversify, it's tried to get into other segments. And some of the, those efforts have gone better than others. Intel spent well before your time, spent a lot of, spent billions of dollars trying to get into communications chips. And that did not go well. Um, talk about the areas that are important for Intel's growth and how and, and, and what the strategy is for being as important in those segments yeah. as Intel has been for so long in PCs. Yeah, yeah I'll do it in two ways. One is um, where the technology, what the technology goes into and what kind of technology. So what the technology goes into I kind of touched on. Um, Again, the PC is roughly uh, four or five years ago was 70% of our business selling a CPU to a PC. Today, that's 50. So what's happened in this data center transformation is, again, the CPU is just going into the side of lots more things. And um, we call it the data center business, but also Internet of Things, where more and more factories require high-performance compute. More and more automobiles require high performance compute. More and more retail shops require high performance compute. More and more hospitals require high performance compute. So over time, as more and more things have demanded more and more compute, we've tried to evolve the business to particular applications that are going to be beneficiaries of the incredible amounts of data that's being created that needs to be analyzed, stored, retrieved, et cetera. So all your businesses are generating more and more data. For us, that means we got to make sure that we're evolving where we're putting our high-performance compute to help you manage and analyze that data much more effectively. So that's a little bit about um, where we're taking the CPU. The what we're taking in, uh, again, particularly as um, uh, the workloads in a data center continue to evolve, the what we're taking inside these is not just the CPU, but it's the GPU. 
No, that's a graphical processing, graphical unit, processing unit. Which when yeah. I think of NVIDIA as being the company that, that I know that, that, that yeah. leads at that. Yeah, yeah. And we have, we've always had a very strong integrated CPU with a graphics chip. But now we're developing a discrete uh, a GP, GPU unit. Um, uh, FPGAs, more custom-oriented products for a data center environment we acquired through a company called Altera. Artificial intelligence chips that go inside everything that we do, but also there's a discrete artificial intelligence chip. So we have a much broader array of architectures that are required in today's data-centric world to do more and more processing, more and more analytics. In addition to that, as the advancement of uh, processing power and compute has evolved and gotten better and better and better, you start to have an impediment called uh, the, the pace of which memory keeps pace with processing power. So if you want to get all the benefit out of the CPU or the GPU or the FPGAs, you need to have, be able to store and retrieve data faster and faster than you ever have before. So the things that go inside include memory. And then the things that make all those work together is software. So if you think about how we've evolved, it's more architectures for hardware, more things like storage, and more and more software that makes them all work together more effectively for those end use cases that I defined. And can you, you know, other than, other than that you're gonna, that you're gonna make good investments, hire good people, and try hard. Is there, can you summarize why Intel will win in those things, where those are areas where there are leaders, and it's not necessarily Intel now. And I know these are no in, new and growing areas, but, but still, what's, what, 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 is, what will be Intel's special sauce in these newer areas? Yeah. Well, I mean, first, the, um, um, the CPU is not going away. The resiliency and the innovation that we build inside of the CPU is, a, is still the uh, predominant uh, processor of workloads um, in all of these different environments. So the role of the CPU continues to be incredibly strong. In addition to that, what, what a lot of our customers are looking for is not simply um, as, their, as their environments get more and more complicated, they're not just looking for the CPU or other pieces of hardware for their environment, they're increasingly looking for a platform. Who has the packaging technology to bring together the CPU, the GPU, the FPGAs, the software? And we believe as we evolve that we have more and more technology, packaging, and processing capability than anybody else on the planet. So as we think about the world today, it was a relatively uh, short period of time ago that we defined the company as having roughly 90% share of CPUs inside the PC and data center. In that world, prospects for growth are not that significant. <laughs> in today's world, in terms of the silicon and the platforms required, we look at our market as a $300 billion TAM where we don't have 90% share, we have roughly 30% share. Yeah. So, so the prospects and the opportunities to grow when you have 30% share of a much bigger market are much more significant. And we think we're uniquely positioned to go after that much larger market. In uh, 2017, Intel spent $15 billion to buy Mobileye, which does technology for autonomous vehicles. Explain what that is and what Intel's part of the market is. Yeah. So I think it, it, it was um, almost a two-year anniversary. Um, um, we couldn't be more thrilled about Mobileye being a part of, of Intel. And again, at its, when we think about those devices, um, those things that require massive compute, um, we think about the industries, automotive being the, maybe the best example where the compute, the horsepower required to enable the evolution of the automobile and future it requires really significant high performance compute. The role of, of Mobileye is really um, a kind of threefold. One, um, and, and I caught part of the discussion on the stage earlier, um, one is um, I think Ken defined um, uh, iterative approach, and I believe Aisha defined 
you know, a, a, a um, gold for gold approach or L5 autonomous driving, Ken is talking about assisted driving. Right. What Mobilize approaches, they are the uh, leading player in providing product inside of tens of millions of cars today of initially L1, L2, L2 plus, L3 products. So its core business is you know, double the size of what, we, uh, of what it was when we bought it. It and generates- what is that size? What, how big a business is it? It was roughly $700 million last year and it was 500 million when we bought it. So if you project forward, you can, um, you can, you can get to kind of the, the, the size of the business today. And I'm sorry for interrupting you, marquee customers are? Um, every, all the OEMs. All, we go, the, all, all the big automakers. Virtually every OEM and or the tier one provider that they rely on. And these, to, to simplify it, these are semiconductor sensors that enable this either assisted or, or, or just shy of completely autonomous driving. At its most um, uh, simplistic level, I'd characterize it as two things. Uh, vision, yep. cameras and then an AI algorithm wrapped around that camera to allow you to process all the information that's being di digested that allows you to drive safely. So that at its core is the L1 to L2 to L2 plus business that is fast growing, lots of customers, 26 design wins uh, over the course of last year. And just, but it, I'm sorry, in addition to that, um, I'm going to get a little fired up because this is a pretty cool business. Um, <laughs> in addition to that, um, we're evolving not just um, you know, putting the hardware inside the car, but how do you then, um, when, you're, when, you're, when you have hardware in tens of millions of cars, you're ingesting a lot of information, a lot of data. And what we've been doing with a lot of our customers, either OEMs or uh, new customers outside the automotive space is how do we leverage this data that's being ingested, processed to make it relevant for new and different applications. So that's the second wave of what Mobileye is trying to do. More service oriented, data rich applications of how we ingest data and use it in new and different ways. The third aspect is really um, in you know, robo-taxi as a vehicle to accelerate the rate of adoption of autonomous driving. So Mobileye is um, you know, deploying technology inside automobiles where we have a very strong position today. It makes a lot of money. We invest that money back in to the second service-oriented opportunity and third, uh, new methods of mobility down the road. So Mobileye itself makes a lot of money. Yes. So just to be clear, so even at a, if you're approaching a billion dollar run rate, it's a relatively, relatively small part of Intel, but you think First of all, it makes money. Second of all, very fast growing and could be a big part of Intel in the future. Absolutely, that's the intention. Um, the big, you know, a, a thing that Silicon Valley people talk about with regard to your leadership and Intel is that you're not a technologist. You're only the second non-technologist to be CEO of Intel. Um, you, you, you know, how do you lead such a technology-driven company not being a technologist yourself? Um, well, first, um, it, you got to make sure that you have a lot of brilliant technologists that you're surrounded by, and I'm blessed with that. Intel is very rich in deep technology capabilities, brilliant people, and my, my role is, um, in some ways, strategy, um, intense respect for what the engineers are capable of, and uh, a huge desire to get them to dream through inquisition. And from that, I think a little bit the power of uh, this incredible technology-rich organization that I'm fortunate enough to lead with a uh, desire to change the world is a pretty powerful combination. Um, your questions, if you have them. Uh, yep, I have one right in the front. It may take a while to get you a microphone. Just, so just stand up and start talking. The microphone's coming your way. Please identify yourself. Michael Miller, uh, Ziff Brothers Investments and PC Magazine. Over the last 50 years, uh, Intel has been known for helping the economy by delivering roughly twice as many transistors for roughly the same price every two years. Mm -hmm. That has become, seems to be becoming harder and harder to do. How do you think that impacts the economy as a whole 
and your business going forward. And of course, Michael's referring to this, the popular notion that Moore's Law is, is dead or dying. Yeah. I mean, in, in one sense, um, it's, um, it gets harder and harder to do, which means fewer and fewer people can do it. And uh, that we characterize as competitive moats. Secondly, um, we've, um, over the last couple of years, um, in terms of Moore's Law or um, transistor density, which in effect was defined as uh, 2x um, the, the, the density in two years. Um, you know, when we, uh, a few years ago, we went from a, a, a process node, we went to, when it was getting harder, um, we went to 2.4 scaling factor. And then this most recent technology, what we characterize as our 10 nanometer technology, we went for 2.7 scaling. So the reality is we're able to continue to scale the technology that provides the capabilities for you to leverage it to kind of grow your business in new and, new and different ways. Um, when we went for a 2.7 higher scaling factor, it took us longer to do it. So our challenge is getting back to um, kind of a 2.0 factor. And our belief is there's lots of, um, lots of road left in Moore's Law, lots of juice left. So we'll continue to innovate and drive process technology in the future. In addition to that, in addition to that, um, there's more things we have to do. So it's not just about process capabilities. Packaging a different technologies becomes more important. So you can put uh, advanced process technology and maybe a last generation technology together on the same chip because the application may not require just current gen technology. The role of these dis different architectures that I talked about before become increasingly important and lastly, software becomes a much bigger role. So at the end of the day, um, customers don't really pay us for chips based on what uh, transistor density they have. They pay us for chips on what performance it delivers. And the deliver of performance is evolving over time. Bob, Different you... architectures, more software, and better packaging. Talking about new architecture, Intel has been significantly late in delivering this 10, 10 nanometer technology, five years late approximately. Um, briefly, why? And secondly, you, you know, as a, as a newcomer, you've addressed the culture of the company that you, you want to you keep some of the best of the old culture, but you need to change it as well. Lots of leaders in the room experience that. Would you talk about that? Yeah. Well, first, the, the challenges of being late on this latest node of Moore's Law was somewhat a function of um, what we've been able to do in the past, which in essence was defying the odds on scaling the infrastructure. And with that um, uh, defying the odds in the past, we set uh, what I said is a very complicated scaling factor. Uh, Moore's Law 2.0. This new node, this 10 nanometer node, we said, let's try 2.7. At a time where it gets harder and harder, we set a more and more aggressive goal. From that, it just took us longer because you got to then, um, um, the way you build the fab and process, you're putting more revolutionary nodes inside the fab. Um, so, so if I can interrupt so you, to the extent that you're late, you set the bar too high rather than anything else is what you're saying. We prioritize performance at a time when predictability was, was really important. Yeah, and I'm sorry to rush so you, we're getting tight, but I, I want to hear about culture. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the short story is we learn from it, we'll get our 10 nanometer node out this year, and we'll, we set our seven nanometer node to the gentleman's earlier question um, that we'll, uh, we'll be out in seven nanometer in two years. Um, and it'll be a 2.0 scaling. So back to the historical Moore's Law, Moore's Law curve. It does relate a bit to, a bit to culture. Um, this company has an unbelievable culture that over the course of 50 years has been out of a reinvent itself by delivering incredible things in technology where the world is changing all the time and built incredibly strong market positions. You know, you don't get to 90% share with a lousy culture. Um, it's a real strength of the company. But today our dreams are much bigger. 
we don't want to have 90% market share because there's not that much room for growth. So if you redefine the role you can play in the industry um, to have 30% share, you have to begin to dare to dream. You're not protecting what you built. You're evolving your thinking. You're daring to dream. And when customers have more choice, by definition, 70% of the market is owned by somebody else, you got to be much more customer obsessed in everything you do. When customers have more choice, you have to be much more competitively aware and work together more as a team, one Intel, uh, where the competition is outside, rather than the competition being uh, for resources inside. And when you go from 90 to 30% share, you have to be more fearless. You have to take more risks to evolve in the technologies that you're doing. And then last, we say, in a, 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 to pull the entire company together and our pace and our, our, our ambitions to play a much bigger role in the industry, more truth and transparency and the free flow of information so it makes the scale of what we do much more nimble and faster. Last but not least, um, diversity and inclusion in everything we do. Having diverse thought and ideas in every room, in every meeting, enhances our thinking and the products that we build and how we go to market. Those five aspects are what we're doing to evolve our wonderful culture because our ambitions and our dreams are much bigger than they've ever been. I appreciate that. I won't, I won't paraphrase back everything you said, but if you listen carefully, he did identify the aspects of the old culture that needed to change. We have time for one quick question and one quick answer, please. Hey, Bob. Rangana, PTW. Um, NVIDIA outbid Intel um, you know, to buy Mellanox earlier this year, and Intel and NVIDIA have been good unspoken partners in the CPU-GPU relationship. Um, does this acquisition mean that now Intel will be focusing heavily on GPU to compete with NVIDIA? And how does the future of GPU look for Intel? Well, first, I think um, the, the players in the industry, um, given these um, incredible demands for data, see opportunity to take our technologies invest in new technologies and capitalize on a much bigger opportunity. And in doing that, we think about organic investments and acquisitions to make us stronger. For us, acquisitions include Mobileye, they include Altera, they include Movidius, they include Nirvana. So we're always investing organically and inquisitively in technologies to enable us to play a much bigger role in the success of our customers. We're not the only one that does that. So obviously, um, NVIDIA, with a relatively large acquisition, they see bigger opportunities to leverage their competencies. So that's just the nature of what we do. And it means that we'll, you know, we'll compete, we'll, we'll be partner where it makes sense, and we'll also compete um, uh, where we have competitive products. Bob, we're out of time. But to re rephrase this question in a yes or no fashion, you, you do, do you intend to compete directly against NVIDIA in GPUs? And graphic, Clearly, our and intention chips. is to, we have uh, integrated GPUs today, and our intentions are to launch a discrete GPU in the next, uh, next couple of years. Bob Swan, Absolutely. thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it.